Lovely. Hello and welcome to A Trip to the Movies, where each week a special guest takes us on their perfect night out at the cinema. This week we are joined by a brilliant actor who broke onto the scene as the iconic character Neil Sutherland in The Inbetweeners. Recently he's appeared on stage in the award-winning play A Place for We before joining the cast of Sky's wonderfully dark comedy I Hate Susie 2. He'll be back on our screens later this year in season two of the BBC's gripping World War II drama World on Fire, here to tell us about all that and take us on his perfect night out at the movies is the brilliant Blake Harrison. Hello. Hello, mate. How you doing? Yes, good. How are you? Welcome to the basement beneath the streets <laughs> of Soho. Wonderful in here. It's all right, isn't it? Is this is this your old stomping ground, Soho? Is, was this where you used to audition? They have a lot of castings oh, around here. Oh, mate. Well, that's it. And still, and voiceovers and all that stuff. I mean, obviously, it's less that now with the auditions in terms of like post pandemic, it's all predominantly self tapes mm. and, and stuff. But, but yeah, the amount I remember like when I first started auditioning, you'd have like the mini London A to Z. Yes. And you'd be going around, oh, where's Rathbone Place and where's whatever <laughs> else it is? And you'd be walking around there with the A to Z. Obviously, it's much easier now with the phones and everything. But um, but yeah, it's, it was def- definitely like here constantly for, for auditions and still for voiceovers. But, but those days are, are gone of being in the room now so much. I, I hear it's coming back, but predominantly now it's all, you know, the, the audition comes through uh, fr- through the email and, and you, you're there with very little notes, very little idea of what, the, the, the character's truly about other than like a paragraph and sometimes they don't even send the script it's just the sides like three, four, five pages whatever it might be of sides and I've got my wife who's not an actor reading the lines opposite <laughs> me and I'm hoping that I've got the general gist of whatever the, the character and the, the story is and it's, it's, it's a shame almost because you feel like you're having to direct yourself and, and obviously light yourself and all these kinds of things but you you're sort of just taking a punt, mm. whereas I feel like auditions uh, pre-pandemic when you're in the room most of the time, it felt more like a collaboration even at that early stage of like, okay, the director's got their idea of what the character will be, I've got my idea, and we can hopefully meet in the middle somewhere and we can I can take on board what their vision is and I can adapt and change things. Now you're just like, you just hope you get it right first thing. There's no adapting, there's no collaboration it's just thrown out there and you hope you hear something back is it is it less nerve-wracking though have not having a a, a row of people those steely yeah. eyes going and come on impressors it's definitely less nerve-wracking but what you get then is like you will do i don't know however many takes you might do of this thing and then you're then flicking through the takes and the, the, the minutiae that you're kind of like assessing within your performance <laughs> like, oh, well, in this one, I scratched my eyebrow, but in this one, I slightly wiggled my nose. And you're just like, like which one's better? Which one would they like more? <laughs> and so you're going for it and it's like, you're killing yourself. You're like, it's not going to matter. They're not going to get, the, you, the overall idea of it is, is, is what it is. Yeah. They're getting what they're getting. They're either going to like it or they don't. Half of them are probably going to turn it off after 10 seconds if they don't think you look right for the role, mm-hmm. regardless of how good your performance so but but you you can't help but painstakingly especially when you really want the role painstakingly just assess everything you do in this self tape and you know compare them and it, and it takes ages and it's yeah i'm i preferred being in the room definitely i was gonna say because some actors don't even watch their performances back because it's like they they don't want to they don't want to see yeah. themselves on screen and you know some do i guess for for research purposes but with a self tape, you're provided with that opportunity to immediately look at a nose wiggle or an eyebrow scratch yeah. <laughs> and catastrophize it. Oh, 100 percent. And that's the thing—you don't feel like you've got a choice, really. I mean, I suppose you you could be quite brazen and possibly arrogant to go. I'm just going to do two takes. I'm going to send them. I'm not going to care anymore. Yeah. And that's probably the healthiest way to go about <laughs> it, if I'm honest. But uh, but you can't help but go. Oh well, I've got to look at what one was best now. And oh, there was a little blip here, or there was a car went past on that one and bibbed its horn so you you can't use that one and stupid things like that again it for me it was simpler just going into the room having the people there you do it you hopefully work with them and and we see what happens so did you have to audition for for world on fire or did was that just a call yeah no that was back in because the first series came out in 2019 so Mm. i would have auditioned for it back in 2018 so this is when you would go into the room a bit more it's one of my last auditions going in the room i think and uh yeah, went in there, did the part. I actually spent a very brief amount of time in army cadets when I was like in my teens. And I remember like a sergeant who would have been um, 
I think in the real army, but he was young, so he probably would have done, maybe he would have earned a bit of extra money going into the cadets or something and just okay. training these young teens and 10-year-olds and whatever it is. And I just remember him shouting all the time. <laughs> so when the, the, the thing came up, it was like, right, man, do it, do it. I just did him. And I, I don't know, but I, I wonder if there's actors out there that wouldn't have had that experience that maybe wouldn't have just done it in that way. Because it's, you're shouting, but it's a controlled shout. It's very, my, it's, 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 there's an authority to it, but it's almost like shouting is my base level of talking. <laughs> I'm not actually angry with you, but it's my base level of talk. This is standard me. And it's that kind of thing. And uh, and I don't know. I think that maybe helped me with the audition because there was definitely that that moment where he's he's kind of shouting at the troops in the audition. I love I love this teacher you had. So um, you you've come from the army. You, you're teaching children children in the cadets. Do you think you might adapt your teaching style? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely not, absolutely not. And I remember one month we went on like this little like weekend retreat, and um, he sh- he was like re- like they were, we were firing blanks and we were split into like two troops, platoons, whatever you want to call it, and we were firing blanks, but he did this demonstration for us where he was like, right, and there was a, a, a bag, a clear kind of, um, not, not like a plastic, but it was plastic, but it was like um, like sandwich bags right. type thing, but a couple of them together holding water, hanging from a branch, and he said, right, watch this, and he held the blank to it, shot it, and it just exploded, and he was like, if you are within 10 feet of it, do not fire. And then, and you're just like, all right, then. So we could actually get hurt doing this because we're all kids. Oh my and obviously God. we were always so far away from each other that you wouldn't. But if anyone misfired or did anything stupid, by the way, we're kids in the army cadets. We were all stupid. Um, then uh, then you could easily have, have hurt someone, I think, because uh, you're saying you saw this bag just explode and it's from blanks, which you imagine, oh, you can't get hurt with blank. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah. Different times though, right? Uh, yeah. We had a police officer, the, the, the school police officer, P.C. Clay was his name, and he came in and he made us all line up alongside the road where we thought uh, if a car doing 60 would stop if it slammed on the brakes to give us an idea of the distance like a car yeah. would travel as a skid. So we all lined up. He drives up the road in a mini metro, drives down at 60 miles an hour and slams on his brakes and just skids past all the kids to prove we'd have all died. That's a controlled skid. Like, you think about that now. When we were literally at the curb, at any point, if he'd gone, oops, like you were taking out 10 seven-year-olds. Wow. They just don't do it anymore. No, health and safety's changed things, isn't it? But then I, th- I, th- I feel like that is what our parents would have said about us. Mm. Oh, back in my day, we just went over <laughs> the park and yeah. we just, we'd gone for six yeah. hours. No one cared. <laughs> now we've got to worry about this and worry about that. And every generation is always moaning that the next generation has got it that bit easier or things are simpler for them or whatever it is. Well, we're getting older. I mean, obviously you've got kids and stuff like there were some woods at the end of my road as a kid that I would go around on my bike as a, like as a six, yeah. seven, eight year old. Now as an adult, I'm more nervous of those woods than I was as a kid. And I don't know what it is about growing up that just makes you weirdly more fearful of the world. Yeah. You watch the news more, maybe. Yeah, yeah. You, you yeah. never used to watch the news no. as a kid. You're like, this is boring. I'm not watching this. I'm just going to go to the park. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, and now you might watch the news and go, oh, no, there's dangers yeah. in the park. Monsters yeah. lurk in the park. Yeah, so, uh, Every yeah. Stra- stranger danger. Yeah, that was just a funny rhyming couple of words when we were kids. But no, it's it's real. Um, so I binged World on Fire season one uh, just last week. Uh, <sighs> it's good, isn't it? Yeah, I, I, I think what uh, Peter Balker and the rest of the writers have done with that is... is is fantastic because I, I think you know we've all watched your, your Saving Private Ryan's and Band of Brothers and these kind of World War Two epics, but I think what World on Fire does really, really well is it showcases and highlights stories that you may not know about quite as much. Mm. And um, with series two in particular, w- um, Stan, the character that I play, is now in North Africa. And I feel like I've seen way more World War II stuff set in, obviously, like mainland Europe and stuff like that. The North African stuff, I think you see a bit less of. Mm. Uh, and I, 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 But also we've got the, um, the tensions and the inequalities between the white British soldiers and the Indian sappers. Mm. And, you know, the, the, the Indian sappers were given the far more dangerous jobs to do. Their rations were different to the white British soldiers. And we, we kind of highlight that and the writers have done a fantastic job of of highlighting that and showcasing that and even though we're all on the same team we're all fighting the same enemy we're not the same Mm. 
uh, in the eyes of, you know, the people making the decisions. And I thought that that was a really important thing to highlight and see that I'd not really seen much of before. And also there's other storylines outside of mine, um, uh, particularly one that is really harrowing, which is the um, the Liebensborn uh, uh, project that happened uh, back uh, within the, the, the Reich. And um, they would take any Aryan-looking girls uh, and willingly or probably unwillingly uh, because families wouldn't be able to do much to stop the Nazi forces taking their children yep. and they would be taking them and uh, making them breed with Aryan soldiers I mean it's like a harrowing Jesus stories Christ. and terrible and and again su some young women went into this willingly thinking that oh I'm gonna be a mum and we're gonna you know they're, they're brainwashed into thinking you know, we're doing the right thing. We're purifying mm. the races or whatever it is was that they were thinking, not really knowing truly because they were they're teens, mm. they're kids effectively, um, and not really knowing what they were, were getting into. And, and it's harrowing stuff that was that was going on. Again, these are stories that I didn't know too much about. And um, yeah, so I think the writers have done a really brilliant job of, of, of highlighting stories that... Uh, are in World War Two that, that people won't be as aware of. Well, uh, obviously, with the backdrop of World War Two, it's it's going to go to dark places. And quite often, when a series goes to dark places, some of which you've just described, and um, you do need those moments of levity, which I think sometimes yep. just hammer home the darkness. And I, I certainly think, especially early on in season one, um, Sergeant Stan Radings, your character. He does provide some moments of levity, as I'm hearing now, uh, probably from your cadet teacher, <laughs> like expressions like, I'll have your bollocks on toast. Yeah. It's like, it's, 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 was that was that something that you enjoyed bringing to an o otherwise quite overpowering, not overpowering, that's the wrong word, but a, a certainly dark moments in the series? I think that they're always some of the best roles, aren't they? Mm. When you When you get to be in a drama... And especially when you've got like action sequences and stuff like that, you've got your drama, you've got your action sequences and you're able to play that because Stan has those moments of, um, you know, these kind of cathartic moments and compassionate moments you know, and, and nice kind of still moments of drama. But equally, when you're then one of the few characters that has the opportunity to bring the levity and bring the comedy within that dramatic world, mm. I just think they're sometimes people's favourite characters when yeah. they watch these shows. I mean, Leslie Manville is so fantastic in World on yeah. Fire. I mean, she's got that thing of like, she can play it so straight and so um, a, a deadpan. And uh, and again, the, the, the drama obviously comes so naturally to her. She's such a fantastic mm -hmm. actress. But the character of Rabina, the way she does it, there are real moments of, of humour mm -hmm. in there. And, and because there's moments of humour in there, it means that the dramatic moments just weigh that bit heavier. And I think that, that yeah, it's, it's an always a lovely thing to be able to play the character that can conflict between both in that world. Mm. Um, obviously, a lot of uh, a lot of people will know you from a character I mentioned at the start. And you've probably answered. I, I'd imagine every question there is to answer <laughs> about the in-betweeners by now. But it obviously has been... God, where are we now? 15 years, I think, since the yep. first season aired. Yep. 10 years since the, the last movie. Do you look back on it? And if you do sort of look back on it and the experience of being in that show, where where do you, what do you feel about it now in 2023? Um, well, I don't know. It's, 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 it's a weird one. I, I think, you know, when you do these jobs, I don't think people realise that you only do them for like six weeks, mm. seven weeks, and then you go off and do other jobs, and then you come back to it a year and a bit later and do another six weeks or whatever. So in a lot of ways, it's brilliant because it's one of the more, like, or it is probably the most successful job I've done, um, and people really love it, and that's wonderful. But in my head, it's sort of mixed in there with all the other jobs mm. that I've done. Um, in a lovely way, um, but I don't know. It's it's certainly a uh, a thing that you you can only look back on it fondly because the adoration it has from from fans. So yeah, I, th I don't really know what else to say. It's, it, it is just one of those things where it's lovely to have, have have been a part of that. But you you kind of move on and you do other things, and 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 that's all where my mind is with it. And it's only when 
other people go, oh, the in-betweeners, they go, oh, yeah, yeah, that, <laughs> that was a while ago, yeah, whatever. But I, I, it's not something that's at the forefront of my mind. But but the funny thing is, when I meet people or have interviews and stuff like that, it's at the forefront of their minds mm. because it's the most successful thing I've, I've done to date. Mm. But, yeah, you just, in, in your head, it's just it's just one of many things you've done. Uh, well, let me be the most uh, recent person in your life to go, oh, the in-betweeners. <laughs> um, two things. First of all, I, I remember being at that first uh, premiere for the first movie. That was a riot. That was, I was like, yeah. a, it was like a rock gig. That audience was wild. They went wild for that movie. That was, it must be a special event in your memory. It, yeah, I mean, it was the first, like, I, I, but again, in my head, I'm just like, What's going on? Like, <laughs> it just feels weird. Like the whole thing just feels mental. Like we did the like, I, I so first series I got without an agent. It was an open call on Spotlight. Mm. I'm just incredibly lucky to have got that. Then uh, we did it, and we were like, "Oh well, this was fun. I might see you around sometime." And then we were like, "Oh, they want to do a second series." <laughs> okay, then fine. Then they did a third series, and then they came to us with this idea of a movie, and we're like, "Well." No one's going to watch that. No one's going to want our four idiot faces on a big screen. <laughs> like, it's bad enough it's on a small screen. No one's going to watch it. And I remember people saying, like, oh, what a terrible idea. You know, like, t films that go from, uh, that come from a TV show never really work. Mm. It is a terrible idea. It won't work. It won't work. And we were like, they're paying us. Mm. They want to go and do it. Let's just do it. And it probably won't work. And then it absolutely one smashed the, it. One of the most successful, if not at the time, the most successful British film. Like uh, we, we were 200 grand short of the King's Speech that year. That was the only wow. film to beat us. And we were this idiot E4 <laughs> comedy show. Like we, we honestly, it, th that's the other reason why I can't, I can't quite, I suppose, talk about it articulately enough because I'm kind of lost for words because it all feels so mental. Mm -hmm. Like still mm -hmm. to this day, it feels like, how did that happen? <laughs> How did this little E4 show go on and become this film that was so successful? Mm. And and again, being there on like the red carpet for that thing, you know, first ever time, Leicester Square premiere, kind of eyes wide. I think all four of us turned up together. We were like, well, we'll all just turn up together and, and stuff. And we were like partners with us and stuff as well. And we were just walking around and there was just like screaming teenagers. And we we're like... I don't get it. Like, I don't <laughs> understand. There was a girl there with like Neil written on her boobs, and I was just like, "What's happening? This is so weird." That's what so I mean. It right, was, it was like a rock concert. It, you were rock stars yeah. arriving like at your gig. It was it was incredible the reception in the room. And I do think you know, I think it, it contains one of the finest bits of of comedy in the way it was constructed, acted, and executed. It's it's the three of you dancing towards the camera to uh, <laughs> we speak no Americana. It's it's just it's exquisite. It's like it's on yeah. YouTube. You can just watch it separately. I, I did again. It's did you know in that moment? Did you did you watch it back? When was the first time you saw that? Did you realize you were creating this little moment of perfect comedy? Absolutely not. No, I mean, I thought, oh, this is kind of funny. And I'd done sort of dance stuff in the series that seemed to go down well. People liked it. So I was like, oh, okay, it's just one of those again. Um, and then uh, I remember us filming it, and it went on for a while. Like, they got so many angles of this dance. Mm -hmm. And me and I think Simon Bird in particular, we were chatting, and we were like, we've got dialogue scenes to do today. <laughs> like, we've got, like, actual jokes to do. Like, shouldn't we be wrapping this up? It, you've got the dance. Like, shouldn't we wrap it up? And they're like, no, we want to get an angle from an angle. And I think we had no idea how funny people would find it. Mm. But clearly, Ben Palmer, the director, Ian and Damon, the writers, they could see it. They, mm. they knew. And, th and that's the other thing. You just, when you're dealing with people that are very clever and very, very funny, like Ian and Damon and, and Ben Palmer and, and all that stuff, then you just have to kind of give yourself over to them and go, right, I know my character. I know what I'm doing. I think I know the funny way to deliver this line everything else you just tell me what to do and i'll do it um because as i say we we at the time we were going there's, there's actual jokes to do guys we need we need to hurry this up a, a little bit if, if we can uh not realizing at all what we had with with that dance um well from the in-betweeners movie to our virtual cinema uh, you did tell me about another movie at the start that i'm go i'm gonna come back to but let's oh, head yeah. let's head to our virtual cinema i'm very very excited about this you're about to enter blake another dimension a dimension of pure film. We're going on your perfect night 
At the movies, you are our guide. We are your audience. Let's begin our trip to the movie. So, we push open the doors to our temple of film and find ourselves in the foyer. There's an excited buzz as there always is in a cinema foyer. The hum of anticipation. It's your perfect cinema trip, Blake. Who have you picked, living or dead, to go with you? All right. How much are we playing with the kind of space-time continuum here? Are we? Is it free range? We it can is. Do whatever we want. This is your dimension. It's the this Blake Harrison my... dimension. Oh, I... It's been named by astrophysicists as your dimension, so you have control of the space and time. Brilliant. I've got the Infinity Stones. That's good. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to go with my two children, but in the future, they have to be older. <laughs> Because they can't, they can't be just like they're ten and six at the moment. Well, they won't. My daughters be ten soon, uh, so they're nine and six at the moment. Soon to be ten and six. There's, there's not the same experience. I want to go when they're old. You know, I want to see them. You know, maybe have a little as things. You mm. doing all right for yourself? <laughs> you, you not become an asshole or anything. We've done well as parents, and if you are, I'll go and change it when I go back into my time. So they don't uh, even live with you now. They've moved out. That's how far in the future. What what age? Uh, what age are we talking? We're talking here? like late teens, early twenties. Okay. So we can go to any movie. Great. You okay. Know, we can go to any movie, late teens, early. But um, the other reason I like, uh, I love taking my kids to the cinema now. But obviously, I, I don't necessarily just want to go and see like a Pixar movie or something like that. So, not that there's a on Pixar. Pixar's lovely. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, you want to keep the options open. But one thing I do all the time is whenever something happens on screen that I think they might find exciting or funny, I'm looking at them. I'm looking at, <laughs> did they enjoy it? Did you, did you, that's funny, wasn't it? And I'm finding myself laughing harder at things that I, like, that, that it's like a little chuckle and I'm like, ha, 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 And then looking at my kids like, it's funny, isn't it? This is a funny thing. We're having a nice time together, kids. It's funny. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I wonder if I'd, I think I'd still do that when they're adults. I really do. I think when they're in their early 20s, we're going to be watching some kind of movie that is, you know, I don't know, a, a, a grown-up comedy or something like that. And I think something would happen that's funny. And I'll go, oh, did they find that funny? They found that, oh, yeah, they found that funny. They found that funny. And it's a weird thing where you're just constantly trying to, like, evaluate what your kid likes and stuff like that. So are you ass are you a a assessing them to make sure you understand their sense of humour? Like, if they're not laughing, are you yeah. like, why did they not find that funny? That well, was funny. It's, it's more... It's more wanting them to find something funny, and if they do laugh, yeah. really going, oh, they found that bit funny. Oh, that's great. Oh, they that's what they like. That they find that funny and right. stuff. And I just, I don't know. There's something about, particularly I suppose when your kids are young, maybe, where, when they're just kind of developing their personalities, and um, like my son in particular laughs with his whole body. Like he has got one of those belly laughs that you're just like when you make him laugh everyone in the room can't help but laugh along mm. because his laugh is so infectious and it's so full bodied. Um, and so when he, uh, when he laughs at something in the cinema, you can't help but look at, oh, he, that's the bit he found funny. And then when we get out of the cinema, it's like, oh, th that bit was good, wasn't it? When he <laughs> fell off the thing or hit his head or whatever it is, some slapstick that he enjoyed, you know, that kind of thing. So we are using the Time Infinity Stone yes. to transport your kids. So they're nine and six at the moment. What are we saying? 10, 15 years into the future? Let's go, let's go like, yeah, like, uh, well, yeah, like, t t t like 15 years is so, what are we talking like, um, so, uh, 24 and like uh, 21, maths something like that. Maths, 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 maths is terrible. <laughs> no, I can't is, do maths. Look at the idiots okay. I play. I'm not doing maths. <laughs> <laughs> No, homeschooling was a nightmare. <laughs> so 15 years in the future. Oh God! During the you mean during the pandemic when you had to homeschool them? Oh yeah, all that all that stuff. Yeah. But you had to be. I guess you had to be strict. Schools checked and stuff. You couldn't just go. Do you want to do a Pixar marathon? Yeah. <laughs> well, I did get. I tell you what, I did. I did get my daughter uh, watching the Star Wars movies, the old ones, and her reaction because she had no idea to not not to I am your father because I think she's watched like some Lego stuff or something where they've maybe given that away a bit. But when she found out that Leia and Luke were sisters, it blew her tiny mind. Her tiny mind was completely blown. She was like, what? They're brother and sister. Oh, my God. I mean, she didn't really pick up on, like, the kissy thing. Like, <laughs> she didn't ask anything about Good. that. Which, yeah. Good, because we um, all wish we hadn't picked up on what but, did that mean. Yeah, yeah, I know. But she just, she just had a real moment of shock. And all, but really pleasantly surprised by it. It's like, yay, they're brother and sister. That, but, but her mind was blown. I could see it in her face. And she was like, what? 
down, and it was it was an awesome moment. That's amazing. It was great. Now, now that's when you want to be. Wa- were you watching her? Like, were you watching her watch that moment? Were oh, I'm there? pretty sure there was a couple of moments where I was looking to her, like, oh, there's a big thing coming up. She's going to react to this. That's okay, great. Yeah, At yeah, six yeah. years old, I yeah. I don't have kids, so that to me yeah. that is so impressive for a six year old to fully understand the concept of everything yeah. that's gone before and that reveal. That's amazing. Yeah, that's great. That's amazing. All right, you're going with your kids 15 years <laughs> in the future. So there's a clock on the wall. It reads a specific time. What time of day have we gone to the cinema? All right, this is going to be weird. I like it when it's quiet. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to pick 1150 Just because I think you've had breakfast. Mm-hmm. You can get some snacks in there. <laughs> you go for a late lunch. That's fine. Oh, yeah, it's nice. 11.50, so you like it quiet. I like it quiet. I'm quite, I think it's quite a lovely thing to do with your day. Maybe especially if it's like a bit colder outside and stuff like that. It's not necessarily summertime. You go into the cinema early, mm. spend a nice bit in the cinema, and you come out, you've still got the rest of your day. You can go and do what you want to do. Yeah. I think that's a lovely start to the day. It is. It is. So would you like it completely empty? Because there's that weird sort of moment where you go to a cinema and it's quiet and you think you're the only person in there, and just before the movie starts, one other person yeah. is in there with you kind of disconcerting yeah i i would struggle with just like the, with that mm. situation i would i would be if i was like um if i walked into a cinema and it was just like empty i'm like paranoid of everything <laughs> so i would definitely be going way near the back so that i could just see everyone <laughs> if i was in the cinema on my own and i like decided to sit in the middle and then one other person came in and sat mm. like behind me oh. even if it was like 10 rows behind me and to the right or something like that I'd be constantly watching the movie and then keep looking to make sure they haven't moved seats or got closer <laughs> to me or something. It would ruin my enjoyment of the film completely. So, uh, so yeah. Uh, it's like quiet, but not like completely empty, but but quiet. Okay. So 11.50 in the morning. Yeah. Fairly quiet. Yeah. Uh, you're taking up your hitman position at the back of the room. So you could, you've got the, you got, you got the revolver on the arm of the chair. 100%. Just in case anyone comes for you. I got there a few hours earlier, laid some Home Alone booby traps. <laughs> just in case. Yeah, for sure. All right, 11.50 in the morning. So you booked the tri- uh, tickets uh, for us to, to go on this trip. Thank you very much, Blake. That's no, very you're, you're welcome. You. You're going to pay me back, though, right? Of course. Yeah, 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 of course. Sure. I'll, I'll do a, a bank transfer. Don't forget to give me your details. Um, so which seat in the auditorium have you chosen for us? Well, I'd probably be like three quarters of the way back. A, you know, sniper position. <laughs> but also uh, B, just, you know, I don't want to be too close. to that. But I, I need to be on the aisle in case this cinema is somehow gets a bit busier mm. um i need to be on the right i have the bladder of an old man like it's not it, it, i will sometimes i will go just before like going into the the cinema and then the chances are that i will go again during the movie and then again as we leave the cinema like, <laughs> i probably should be going to a doctor but the, i don't know if it's psychosomatic or what it is like going to the theater is even worse um but, uh, the aisles are even narrower there, and you're not really meant to stand up when the, you've no. been on stage. Obviously, yeah. I mentioned the play. Some shows, they're like, you're not allowed re-entry, mm. and you're there just kind of shaking, be like, I can't leave, but I really need a wee. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, so I'd like to be near an aisle just so I can nip out, mm. get to the toilet very quickly, run back, try not to miss anything. I'll be like, tell me what I've missed. And then I need to come back and come back, like, so what happened? What have they done? I'll be that Put it there. You see, I'm, I, I said to you at the start when you mentioned that, I, that I, I'm in the same boat. And it's I just I've had people say to me, genuinely, go and see a doctor because I'm like, you know, three, three times in a movie. But I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think it's in our heads. I think we've now built up this yeah. this thing where it's like you feel even the slightest bit of pressure on that, <laughs> that bladder wall, yeah. which is getting very graphic very quickly. And you're like, you're like, no, that's it. I have to go now. Because yeah, no, no. then you can't enjoy it. Because even if you can hold it for the next hour, mm-hmm. You're not taking in the movie. Not engaged. You got you got to empty it, and then you can focus again. Yep, yep. Uh, good. You're an isler as well. I like it. So am I. Three quarters of the way back, and putting you on the aisle. So the final thing we need before we leave the foyer and head to the auditorium. God, the air is full of wonderful smells. Oh, all manner of snacks and foodstuffs are available. What are you choosing to eat? Sweet popcorn. A big bag of sweet popcorn. That's it. The, the, I only eat popcorn in the cinema. I n- never never buy popcorn or have popcorn at home mm. or, or anything like that. And the sweet popcorn in the cinema, I mean, I think it's terrible for you. Mm. I mean, the diabetes o'clock when mm. you have like a lot of that sweet popcorn. Mm. But it, it I, I just, I love the taste of it. I think, it's, I think it's great. And I will probably finish the entire trough 
of sweet popcorn before the film even starts, just in the previews. I'll be going to town. I eat fast, and I'll just be going to town on that popcorn, and it will probably be gone by the time the movie actually starts. So, I, I mean, you know, you, you are a bit younger than me, but obviously this is a very classic order, because when I was a kid, popcorn was it. But now, oof, you've got pizza, hot dogs, burgers, nachos, all sorts of pick and mix. None of that interests you. Uh, no, I, 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 I might be wrong. I can't imagine a cinema doing those well. Like, if you want a pizza, mm. go for a pizza afterwards. Or you know, grab a takeaway pizza, whatever it is. You know, don't, don't sit. I can't imagine cinema pizza tasting nice. I mean, I don't know. I've never tried it. I'm like you. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very classic in my order. I'm yeah. a, you know, but... And also, you can take that to too great a degree, though. Like, I, <laughs> I won't eat seafood unless I can see the sea. Uh, because <laughs> I'm like, I hear you though. I, get I don't know where it's been. How long yeah. has it been sitting in this kitchen? Yeah. It's uh, so yeah. I mean, All how right. far away from a farm do you have to be before you eat like <laughs> beef or something? It's like, are you getting your Google Maps out and you're like, we are more than five miles from the nearest farm. Don't get the beef, guys. Don't get that beef. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I can't have this bread. I don't live near a bakery. Yeah. It's, just, it's just, it's no. Where's the flour mill? <laughs> I can't see it. Uh, it's a very good point. Any drink? Well, because I'm worried about going to the toilet, I'll just probably have like a bottle of water that I'll barely touch. <laughs> it's just to wash down the odd bit of popcorn that's not sliding down naturally. <laughs> Little tiny Little sips. Little tiny sips. Mm. Yeah. Okay, okay. Sweet popcorn and a bottle of water. You you don't want to have little tiny sips of a fizzy drink? You're well, I, I, I love like a, like, like a Fanta or a Coke Zero or mm. something like that. But I swear that will make me go quicker. <laughs> that that is again, it's a psychological battle going to the cinema. <laughs> You're not making it sound a ton of fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't go anywhere with me. I'm not fun. I'm paranoid. I have to plan everything. I'm no fun. Don't go with me. I'm sitting at the back, taking tiny sips of water with a gun on the chair, with yeah. your legs crossed. <laughs> Just going, God, I can't wait for this movie to be over. <laughs> the, the chair rocks and there's a cat next to me as well. That's that's. What <laughs> All right, then, let's get out of the foyer. We've got everything we need. We're walking down the corridor towards the auditorium. Now, it's looking a bit bare at the moment, so what I want to do is put up some posters to illustrate some of your most important movie memories. And the first poster depicts your fondest movie memory. Um, I'm going to go with No Country for Old Men. Ooh. And my reason for that is um, I knew nothing about it when I went to see it and I went to see it on my own and it was the first time I'd ever gone to the cinema on my own. I'd gone to Manchester for an audition and um, my trains were 10 hours apart, like going there and coming back. So um, I went, I did my audition, I did my thing and then I was like, well, I've got like five, six hours to kill in, in Manchester and I, I didn't know what to do. So I... I just thought, oh, it's good. I'll go to the cinema. And so I went to the cinema and I was like, what's on? Oh, no country from, I'll give it a go. I don't know anything about it, I'll give it a go. And I loved it so much. I thought it was such a fantastic film. And the fact that I'd, I think I'd gone for like a TGI's or something before and had a bit of TGI's, <laughs> then went into the cinema and uh, got me popcorn, sat down, watched it. It was pretty quiet. Again, just all alone, just you know, master of your own domain. You're just like, I'm not on anyone else's time. It's just me doing my thing. And and I loved it. And I just, yes, yeah, from that moment on, I'm like, sometimes I think going to the cinema on your own is the best thing. But um, but yeah, so that that's that's my, uh, my fondest movie memory, I think. So it's amazing, isn't it? The fact that we live in this era of the movies are so heavily promoted. There's trailers and, and people thrive on these trailers. It's like a new trailer. Trailer number three has come out. Yeah. And it's rare that you actually get to go into a movie and have no idea if it's even a comedy, a drama. No. What What is this I'm watching? Yeah. And you explore it as the movie's unfolding. It's such a rare experience. I've only had it once um, for a movie called Rules of Attraction. And I didn't, I, I was a last minute screening. It's a this dark Roger Avery movie. And it to date, like you, it's one of the best experiences I've had because I just didn't know what was going to happen yeah. at any point. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Um, did you also enjoy it? Because some people love to discuss a movie afterwards, you know, go for a beer, go for a glass of wine, whatever. But because you were on your own, you got to just sit with what you'd just seen. Yeah. 
And it's quite something to sit with. I mean, no country for old men. There's a lot going on there. Some fantastic performance. I mean, the the standout is obviously Javier Bardem. I mean, what he does in that movie is incredible. I mean, I might mention it later, but the gas station scene with the flipping the coin with that guy. I mean, unbelievable. Just the whole cattle prod thing as a weapon. Mm -hmm. Like, that was incredible. The scene where he finds Josh Brolin in the hotel... And, uh, and you know, they're kind of chasing each other down the street a bit and all of that, and he's running away. <sighs> Unbelievable. Mm. Unbelievable. And it's an air gun he has as well as the cattle prod thing, doesn't he? He kills people with air. Mm. It's like highly pressurised yeah. air. That's the yeah. thing. Right, okay, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, Yeah, he's brilliant in that movie. He's brilliant. I was going to ask, um, obviously, I, I don't know if it was a fondest movie memory, but you mentioned at the start that uh, you just shot a movie with cinema legend Harvey Keitel last year. Yeah. What would tell me about that? I mean, that was just mental. So it's called Spread, and mm -hmm. it's uh, set in a, a failing porn magazine. It's a comedy. Right. Um, and what's great about it is it stars... Uh, the, main, uh, uh, the main kind of character you're following is uh, played by Liz Gillies, and it's uh, uh, kind of written, starring, and directed by women. But it's kind of... Um, a really fun, interesting look at a kind of like, so, I don't want to call it a gross out kind of sex comedy, but there's definitely elements of that in there. Mm -hmm. And you just think, when you think of those types of films that were like more geared, geared towards teenagers, maybe of our generation, your American Pies and stuff like that, this is more, it's definitely way more grown up than that. But equally, it, um, it's, it's got such an interesting viewpoint because it's, as I say, written, directed by and starring a, a woman. So mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of a female perspective on a lot of these issues like the porn industry and, and, and stuff like that. And Harvey Keitel plays uh, the head of this porn magazine and I play a uh, very, very odd IT guy. Um, <laughs> And uh, so when's it yeah. set then? So is it is it's it is modern it day? OK, it's, so it's, it's not set around the period where sort of a print press started to decline. It's it, it's around it's set in no, the present. It's kind of like they're very behind the times. And okay. They need to kind of update everything, really. And um, yeah, it definitely explores kind of female views on, on uh, 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 porn and sexuality and, and, and stuff like that. But equally, it's just very, very funny. <laughs> and uh, do you know Deirdre Bader from like Veep and, and I'm trying to think what else he's oh, done that. But yes. Like, he's got an amazing voice. Yeah. Uh, he's in it as well. And I loved him in Veep. So I was like like working with him as well. But I mean, there was a lot of improv as well. And I was doing like a, a American accent and, and, and kind of improvising with Harvey Keitel. <laughs> and you're just like, this is so weird. Because, uh, you know, obviously you, you've got like, I grew up watching things like uh, Mean Streets, Reservoir Dogs, mm. Pulp Fiction, all these classic movies from the kind of like would have been like late 90s mm -hmm. and, and, and Mean Streets obviously before that I think um, uh, but they, these kind of films where you're like oh my god this is making me want to be an actor I remember being at like at drama school or like um, in, in, in sixth form watching these kind of films over and over again going that's cool isn't it that's super cool I'd love to be in a film like that that's cool <laughs> And then, I mean, 83 now, and still got it. Like, amazing performances and, he was doing. And not scary, because, you know, I, you read some of the, the stories around, like, Quentin Tarantino is very vocal about, you know, his confrontations with Harvey on the set. I think it was from Dust Till Dawn, and, you know, and yeah. how he, he can be, you know, he's quite, he can be quite an imposing figure. Was yeah. he Was he quite fun and, and gentle? He was very fun and, and, and gentle and just kind of making the crew laugh and enjoying himself mm. and all those things. I mean, maybe because it was a comedy, he was yeah. a bit more light with it all and stuff but but equally maybe it's just like oh man he's he's 83 and he's Harvey Keitel he's got nothing to prove to anyone he can just swan into a room <laughs> and just be like well I'm Harvey Keitel so I mean listen to me and how was it was it nerve-wracking improvising opposite him or was or when you're actually on set and you both know your part and you know what you're doing and you know your characters it is just a day at the office not to um, not to make it seem like every day but it's like you're not actually sort of thinking oh my god i'm with harvey Keitel in the moment it's a mixture it's a mixture because you you can't shut off that brain of like oh my god it's, <laughs> it's harvey Keitel. That, that 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 voice in your head is, is definitely there but obviously when you know the character well and you've been around him a little bit. Like, day one is always, like, the one you're like, Jesus, is Harvey Cartel? What's Harvey Cartel? Um, but, uh, but after that, you, uh, you kind of just kind of settle into it. You get to know him. He's a lovely guy. And, uh, and then you're just thinking, how can I make this funnier? 
how can I just do what would the and again my character is an oddball so you're just like what would he do in this situation yeah. um and then you just try and like you might take it to the nth degree and then be told let's pull that back a little bit Blake that's a bit big. I'm like yeah no fair enough mate <laughs> I was having a bit too much fun there um and uh and you know but that that's it but it's it's a great experience to go and, and do that and we shot it in Canada in Vancouver which is a gorgeous place mm. well, what I mean never been to, to Canada before and I think Vancouver is one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to in my life. It was it was unbelievable. It is, isn't um, it? It's, yeah, it's just got everything. You've got like the, this kind of city centre, and then twenty minute walk down the road, you're like you're on like the beach, and then it's got the the kind of hiking mountains and gorgeous sea. Like you do a bit of whale watching, seeing some humpback whales and stuff. You're like <laughs> this place has everything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I love the mountains. I I, I love the, the whales as well. Oh come on, you're <laughs> spoiling us, Vancouver. Um, wonderful. Where is spread out? Is it coming out? When's the when can, where can we see it? I mean, oh, I, I don't know when it's out. Okay, it's, uh, but I we'll believe, look out for it. Yeah, yeah, look out for it. But I don't know when it's coming out. But hopefully. It'll be out at some point this year, but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of waiting to see, really. Exciting times. Right. The next poster, as we continue down the corridor, depicts your worst movie memory. Oh, okay. I'm an, I've, I've, you might have to help me make a decision. All right. And you might have to do that for a few questions. <laughs> so I'm torn between Jaws and 28 Days Later for similar reasons in that both amazing movies, but couldn't like that they affected me negatively afterwards I, I couldn't swim in a swimming pool as a child <laughs> without thinking George can get me I was like one of the fastest swimmers in my swim club because all I'd be thinking is George is going to get me that was in my head the whole time I was probably like eight or nine years old or whatever swimming lengths so rapid because I was scared a shark was going to be in the swimming pool I mean this is like a swimming pool in South East London <laughs> there are no sharks in there Blake but I couldn't help but be fearful of that it's such a weird thing um, and for even more weirdness 28 days later man I just started thinking well if this happens I live in London and I'm not as fast a runner as you would think I am with my long legs I think I'm done <laughs> Like, I think if 28 days later happens, I'm dead. There's no, now I've got kids, I'm definitely dead. Like, it's just, <laughs> like, if any zombie stuff happens now and they're fast-moving zombies, I am in big trouble. But because you're going to wait for your kids, you're not going to run off. But that's, that's what you well, mean. Yeah, I mean, you're going to have to wait for the kids. I mean, yeah, you, can't, you, you, can't, you can't run off and then tell someone, you know, I had kids, but I left them. You know, it looks bad, as much as you might want to. It yeah. just looks bad. Bad and optics. So, uh, an awkward parents' evening. Where, yeah. are, they, where are the kids? No, they, zombies. They're, they're now zombies. Yeah. <laughs> because I just left them. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so uh, so I, I don't know which one to, to go for. Both have affected me deeply. I have had nightmares about fast-moving zombies, and that's not a joke. Okay, it's a really difficult one for me. I played a fast-moving zombie in Dawn of the Dead. Did you? But... Not like the, the remake, the American the remake. remake, yeah. That affected me as well. It's probably <laughs> you. It's your fault. I've had nightmares about this. I, will, I remember watching, uh, you know, I've I, been around a mate's house, had a few drinks and some other things, and watched uh, uh, Dawn of the Dead, and it was probably like 1 a.m., and I ended up walking like the 15-minute journey home, and the whole time I was just looking over <laughs> my shoulder, like, oh, no, the zombies are coming. I was probably about 20. That's how weird I am. I'm fe fearful of everything. Uh, this is uh, it's such a tough call because sharks are real and uh, Jaws. I'm, I, I, <laughs> sharks are real. Sh sharks are real. Uh, I checked. Uh, I, Jaws affected me in the same way it uh, affected you. Uh, to, to quote the famous scar scene in Jaws uh, where Hooper goes, I got that beat. I couldn't have bubbles in the bath for about 10 years <laughs> in case a trap door opened and I couldn't see a shark swim <coughs> up and grab me from the bath. So I'm wow. with you. So I'm going to pick Jaws. Let's go with Jaws. All right. Let's go with Jaws. Jaws is your worst movie memory. Putting up a poster. Right, the third poster depicts the last performance, Blake, that brought you to tears. Um, okay. I've got... A, the, the last performance, I can't remember. So again, since having kids... Mm. The floodgates are open, man. Like, I didn't use <laughs> Does to it really make you more emotional? 100%. I don't know why anything to do with kids, anything like that. Even watching, like, the start of Up or, like, that, 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 that is, absolute, yeah. is absolute killer. Um, I remember watching, uh, was it Saving Mr. Banks, Emma Thompson and, and, and Colin oh, Farrell? That, God, that got me. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. absolutely got me. Yeah. And I don't think I would have cried at those the way I was pre having kids. I just like, man, I but the That's one thing, I don't, I don't know why. It's just like, I've always been quite like, I don't know, like 
sensitive. I've never been like a tough bloke, obviously. Right. Yeah. Look at me. But, um, <laughs> but I never cried at things. It just never cried. But the one film that made me cry, so it's not the last one, but it's one that sticks out to me, and I used to get the mick taken out of me for it as well. Boromir's death in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> that absolutely does me. Yeah. It's like, he's, you know, he's made a mistake yeah. with poor little Frodo. Yeah. He's, he's done the wrong thing and he wants to make amends. He's sorry, Frodo, but Frodo's gone. He can't apologise yeah. to Frodo. And then was it like Merry and Pippin? Yeah. They're getting taken yeah. and he's like in there and he's absolutely smashing the uruk oh, yeah. and he's doing them in. And then all of a sudden that one with the hand on his face just starts <laughs> slinging the arrows in him. But he still keeps fighting. <laughs> Go on, Sean Bean. Give it to him, mate. You've got two arrows in you and you're still going, son. Love it. And then <laughs> he gets done. Aragorn kills the other one, comes up to him. And he's like, they took the little ones. And you're like, oh, mate, I'm done. I'm done. Tears are streaming. <laughs> Poor Boromir. He oh. made a mistake. It's so true. Oh, it is. It's uh, where he's in. The, where he's, it's the bit where he's sort of in all the leaf litter on the floor. He's like, Frodo, F Frodo, <laughs> and then the horn of Gondor. He's blowing yeah. the horn. Ah, oh, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, 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 perfect. Perfect. Yeah. That is such a great moment. Boromir's death in Fellowship of the Ring. That yep. is the last performance that brought you to tears. So we've got one more poster to put up before we enter the auditorium. And this depicts, Blake, your unpopular movie opinion. Um, all right. So, again, slight, slightly torn here. But first one is keep your horror movie adverts away from everything <laughs> other than horror movies. Like, I don't want to see it. I don't want to be about to watch like an episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm or something like that on Sky or whatever it is. And it's like, the latest Halloween film. <laughs> or, you know, this doll comes to life and will cure shit up. Or like, whatever it is. Like, I don't want to see it, mate. I'm not interested in horror films. Don't like them. Too scared. No, thank you. But you still put the adverts in normal TV. Why? <laughs> Why I don't want to see it? I have never considered this in my life. As a horror fan, it's just water off a duck's back. But I get it. So you don't like horror? I don't like horror. I was in... Ah, oh, this is embarrassing. I was in a horror film recently called The Kindred. Mm -hmm. And um, I went to the premiere of it. And it was like... We had like a little cast seating area kind of at the back. Cast and crew seating area. Which wasn't totally full. And I had quite a lot of seats near me that, that were empty. And whenever the violins come in and you know something's happening, I'm in this movie. I know what's happening. I know like the actors in it. Whenever the violins are coming, I know it's like a jumpy bit or something. It's involved like ghost children and stuff like that. You're like, no thanks. And um, <laughs> and so I'm like covering my eyes a little bit and I'm pretending I'm watching it, but I'm not really watching it. I'm sort of covering my eyes and like shutting my eyes and kind of looking away from it, but trying to look like I'm not like almost like sort of like just cross legged and a bit chilled out. And um, <laughs> I was doing that. And the next thing I know, I look up and the, the, a, a woman says, excuse me. I'm like, and I jump. And this woman stood over me that was like someone on the crew. And she's like, can I just get past you, please? Because <laughs> I had my legs crossed that were like blocking the aisle thing. And um, she must have clearly seen that I wasn't watching the movie because I would have seen her coming towards me. So she's seen me be scared of a movie <laughs> I'm in. That was so embarrassing. It was terrible. So, yeah, so that is... Wow. That is it. I don't know if that's unpopular. I don't think. I think it'd be a very popular opinion I, with people that hate horror films. I think you might have started a movement here because I mean, I, there's probably other people who feel like this. I, again, yeah. as a fan of horror, I've never considered it. What was so? What was? Was there a moment where you watched a horror movie and this this began? You sort of realised that these movies aren't for me, oh, or has it just always been there? I've just, I think it's just always been there. I remember like on Nickelodeon, you'd watch like Are You Afraid of the Dark and like some other vampire film because all the other kids watched it. Mm. And then I was like, well, I can't sleep now. <laughs> like, Mom, <laughs> Mom, I can't sleep. Um, so, so, sorry, yeah. a Nickelodeon horror series is where this, was, this began. Probably, <laughs> probably. I mean, I was a kid. It was probably yep. something like that. Reading, I read Goosebumps books, and I kind of loved it. And I love anything like werewolf, vampire. I love it. Okay. Me, I absolutely love it. I don't see that as proper horror for some reason. I see it as a slightly different genre. So that I love. Interview of Vampire, amazing movie. Even the Underworld films, which I know is like maybe not everyone's cup of tea. Like mm. that's a guilty pleasure for me. Mm. Love all of that. Um, but yeah, they they don't seem like horror for me. But anything that's like, I don't know, like slasher and Pos ghosts and psychological and like, any, any of that right. stuff. Like what was I tell you? What I saw there was, I think there was like an episode. I, I, I think I think it was an advert. It was an advert. It might have been something like. 
or haunting or something like that. And some kid goes, they live in some kind of building that used to be clearly like a restaurant or hotel or something. Some kid goes in a, um, what are they called? The dumb waiter things. You mm. know where you, it's like yeah. a, a, a it's pulley system. Yeah, yeah. It's like the little mini elevators that food would go in. Some little boy goes in there and his sister sends him down to the basement for a laugh and all that stuff. And he goes into the basement and there's something in there that like he's like pull me up pull me up and she can't pull him up and it's this thing with like no legs that's just like clear like human form like crawling towards him and i swear that was on like an advert or something <laughs> and i'm like what no, what are you doing to me man i don't need this in my life all right then so the final poster we're putting up that depicts your unpopular movie opinion is that you like the underworld movies and uh, that's what I've taken from. <laughs> I love the first one. The first one was no, I'm great. Jo- I'm joking. I, they are a guilty pleasure. Okay, so do not put horror movie adverts. It's, it's more of a sign than a poster. Do not put horror movie adverts anywhere but in front of horror movies. Yep. All right, then. We'll push open the last set of doors. It's a very brightly lit corridor, by the way, Blake. There's Thank no, no God dark, for that. No dark shadows or anything. And uh, now there's a, there's a few people hoping to join you in the cinema. You said you want it quiet. You're going to invite these few people in to yeah, share it with you few, and your... Let's not make it like a quarter full. Okay. A quarter full is, a quarter is the max. Full. All right, letting a quarter of the crowd to be with you and your future children. So, before the movie you've picked for us begins, we're going to play a few things on the screen. The first thing we're going to play is the trailer for the movie you were most looking forward to seeing in the cinema. Um, so, I'm not 100% sure of this. I think that um, the one of the Star Wars franchise things that will be coming out at some point is like The Old Republic mm. or something like that. Yeah. Which uh, I was obsessed with Knights of the Old Republic on the Xbox. Okay. I don't know if you know. It was like an RPG game back, I don't know, looking at probably like 20 odd years ago now. And um, it was the best. And it was set like a thousand years before any of the Star Wars stories we know. And it was like, there's loads of Sith, there's loads of Jedi, it's all kicking off. There's a, You play a character called uh, Revan, and uh, spoiler alert, Revan was the evil Sith before it, all this shit happened. Before, this so, is even before, before Darth Vader, happened, before so it's like, Darth Maul, before yep, Palpatine. Yep. So you're basically playing a guy that was the evil bad guy, but you didn't know this until right at the end of the mo- of the computer game. Uh, so if the, movie, if, game. if the movie follows that, then I've ruined that for people. But, uh, <laughs> but it was it was brilliant. It was like such a great game. And if they're doing anything, because I'm a big Star Wars fan, I'll watch anything kind of Star Wars related. And if they're doing like something set way before the kind of Skywalker stuff, mm. and it's all like old school Jedi, Sith, all that, I'll I'll lap that up. I would love that. Okay, so I, the only Star Wars movie I know of is obviously the the, the new one's going to be the story, a Ray's story. It's a continuation of Ray's story, Daisy oh, Ridley's really? character. Yeah, okay. But hypothetically, I mean, this is uh, <laughs> not to make it any less fantastical it's quite an important ip to disney so i imagine they are yes. going to be uh, developing movies so we're gonna we're gonna say we're gonna play a trailer for a movie set in the old republic potentially based i'm sure it is happening they've announced okay. something okay about good it. yeah maybe it's, it's maybe it's in, okay great fine yeah. fine so we're playing a trailer for uh, the uh, Old Republic. I'm just going to call it the Old Republic. If you don't think of Star Wars, the Old Republic sounds like the <laughs> nastiest movie ever. Oh, we're going to watch the Old Republic, guys. Oh, you want to come see the Old Republic? Oh, tally ho, lovely. It'll be like those scenes with the Council of Jedi in Attack of the Clones where they're just all sitting around <laughs> failing to make any decision. And you're like, what is going on? So do you, you, you say you're a Star Wars fan. Originals, prequels, like new ones. Do you like my, all of it? My, my. Well, I can get involved in in pretty much all of it. Um, I love the original. The originals are Empire Strikes Back to me. That's the one. Mm. That that is the pinnacle. Mm. I, th- in terms of the prequels, I can pick out moments that I liked. Phantom Menace is obviously widely seen as like one of the worst ones. Darth Maul is an awesome character. Great, yeah. Darth, Duel of the Fates is one of the best movie songs ever. Like, it's a phenomenal song. Um, so there's definitely good moments in it. Um, what I love, there was a Lego thing about it, and they were like, 
highlighted the fact that that whole movie is about a trade dispute. Like, <laughs> the yeah. first yeah. The Phantom Menace movie, it's a trade dispute? Yeah. But like, that's not exciting. <laughs> you want children to go and watch a movie about a trade dispute. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, that's a weird one. But, uh, but yeah, and, and the newer ones, like, there was definitely some great, like, Force Awakens I thought was actually really yeah. good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really Agree. good. And, um, and yeah, there, there's, there's definitely moments I can pick out of all of them. I, I thought... Um, what was the uh, the one between uh, the prequels and the originals? Uh, what was it called? Oh, Rogue One. Rogue One. Mm. I liked Rogue One. I yeah, thought Rogue One was was, was, was really good. really good. It was good. And it I like the good. Mandalorian stuff as well. I love all oh, the Mandalorian yeah. stuff. Yeah. Rogue One. I mean, Vader at the end of Rogue One oh. is the first time where you're like, now I get why he's he, how how was he not scary for a while and now he's actually a monster. Yeah, it was, it was brilliant. Great. Right then, the next thing we're going to play on the big screen is the movie moment that makes you literally or metaphorically pump your fist in the air. Oh, it's a small thing. It was badass as hell. The way Legolas gets on that horse in the two towers, <laughs> when it's coming up behind him and he just reaches his hand back and somehow swings over onto the horse. That was incredible. I love oh. that. So I'm going to pick that. I mean, I maybe would have picked something better had I realised about that one. Yeah. But that I, is a moment where I watch it and go, yeah. I don't know if it's as much pump the fist in the air as it's like smile and nod to myself and go, yeah, mate. Yeah, I think it's the same reaction. It's, yeah. a, it's a more subdued reaction, but yeah. that, I know exactly the bit you mean because yeah. it really, it, it's this fine balance between something that you go, well, that that's impossible. Like physics doesn't allow you to do that. And yet you watch and you go, I know, I'm, 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 I'll buy that. I'll buy it, I'll Legolas. Buy that. You badass. Love it. <laughs> All right, Legolas getting on the horse in that badass way. Right, <laughs> what uh, do you consider cinema's most shocking moment? I am going to pick... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pick the reveal that Hans was a bad guy in Frozen. <laughs> Did you see Frozen? Yeah. Hans was never meant to be a bad guy. He was like the love interest. And then he's like, oh, oh. Anna, I'm like, and then she's like about to die because she's got like ice in her heart. And he's like, oh, Anna, if only there was someone out there that loved you. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> oh, my God, he was a bad guy all along. We thought it was Prince Charming, but he's not. Let's go with that. Oh, wonderful. That's a great one. Uh, what is your favourite piece of... Uh, what, what line or piece of dialogue from a movie most affected you? Oh, well... I mean, just favourite kind of line or piece of dialogue. Uh, I don't know about most affected, but just I, I, I love, and mm. I think it's pretty... I mean, are we talking like a scene? Can it be like... It could be, again, yeah. the gas station scene in, in No Country for Old Men mm. is... Just incredible. Yes, it the is. way the guy just doesn't know what's happening. He's like, with that amazing voice, like, call it, call it. <laughs> and he's like, well, I don't know what we're calling here. And I don't know what we're talking about. And he's like, like what do I stand to win? He's like, everything. He's like, oh my <laughs> God. It's just, he has no idea what it's, but there's clearly something. And he's, he, it, it was, do you know what? We talk about Javier Bardem. I don't know the actor's name that's in that scene with him. Mm. He's brilliant yeah, yeah. because there's clearly. A kind of he's unsure but he's, he shows a, a lot of fear in such a subtle way that it's like he's clearly on the back step he doesn't know what's happening he's fearful but equally he just doesn't know if this guy's a bit weird and a bit confused so he doesn't outwardly show the fear too much but you can really tell he's afraid mm. and that is such a brilliant moment between the two of them that I just I just think that scene is absolutely phenomenal I, I, I love that scene and um it's a great scene. I, let's, yeah. I think we'll pick that because, uh, yeah, and the, I think you're right. I think the moment that is, like, just full of terror and tension is call it. Yeah. Call it. Yeah. Great stuff. Can I just add as well, I'm in a glass case of emotion from Anchorman. That's another just absolute <laughs> classic. You can't watch that and not laugh. That's amazing. <laughs> I'm in a glass case of emotion. All right. So we'll print up some T-shirts for the audience and, yeah. uh, and yourself and your future children. With I'm in a glass case of emotion. <laughs> it sounds like when you say my future children, that it's the children I haven't had yet. I have had them. They've been around a long time. One of them's nearly a decade old. Right, yeah. My children in the future. Children of the future. Ch your children of? No, that Ch still sounds like you're... Yeah, I know. I don't know how we can I don't say want this. your kids to listen to this and go, 
Oh, oh really? You're gonna take the future kids, not me. I'm not good enough for you, Dad. It's the kids you're gonna have down the line. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Your children a decade. No, again, still doesn't yeah, work. Yeah. Uh, right. The final thing before we get to the movie you've picked for us to play on the big screen tonight is the best use of music in a movie. Can be a score, a soundtrack. Um, best use of music in a movie. Oh, we've mentioned Jewel of Fates already. I mean, that is that is just such. And again, for a film that is widely not loved by the audience that you know are really passionate about like Star Wars and stuff you cannot tell me that song's not amazing mm -hmm. like that it's just such a phenomenal piece of music I have regularly got the lightsabers out with the kids <laughs> run into the garden and played Jewel of Fates <laughs> on my phone and just been smashing with smashing lightsabers around with the kids um, it's been it's great we, we absolutely love it it just it does so much it's so the kind of um, the vocals on it along with that fast kind of like stringed orchestra thing you're like oh, it's just great man it's just so good it is it's brilliant it's brilliant best lightsaber fight in the entire star wars universe it's up there it's, it's up there i'm trying to think of what more modern ones there might the have been. anakin and obi-wan at the end of uh, revenge of the sith yeah. is quite good it's i've good. got the higher ground yeah i don't know that that darth maul with his double oh, it's just too cool man Darth Maul with a double lightsaber, I, d I think that's hard to beat. With that music in the background, and the way that it kind of starts, the way that he turns up, the doors open, and it's like, oh, no. and then he just takes down the hood, yeah. and then they're like, we'll deal with this. And then the others go and do something else <laughs> while Obi-Wan yeah. and Qui-Gon are there. And then he takes off that like cloak, and then he just does one lightsaber, mm. and then the other one comes out, you're like, Oh, he's got two on one <laughs> stick. Right. And you remember that? Because we all, we all grew up on Star Wars and it was like, well, I mean, I've seen a lot. We've never seen that kind never of seen light that paper. one. That was great. Yeah. All right. Brilliant. Jewel of the Fates from F F the Phantom Menace. Oh, Blake, here we are. We've arrived at the moment. The movie you have decided to play for us tonight in this auditorium out of all other films, the film that potentially is the most important to you. What film have you decided to screen for us at 11.50 this morning? Okay. Um, I was, I still just wasn't sure what to pick, but because there was a section in this that I thought we were going to talk about that we haven't, mm. I'm going to pick that one, and it's going to be The Dark Knight. Yeah, and yeah. that chase scene, when... Uh, um, Harvey Dent is in the uh, the police truck, and then the Joker is like he gets like the bazooka out, and, like, and then um, uh, there's that amazing moment where it leads on to the the chase where uh, Christian Bale's on the the bike, and uh, Heath Ledger comes out of the lorry after it's been tipped, and he's just standing there, he's like hit me, hit me, and he's like I want you to hit me, hit me, and all this stuff, and you're just like oh my god, there's just so much about it in those little moments where you're like. Is it, I don't know, in my head, I'm like, is it because he just, he, he knows his death would be better than his life? Mm. Or is it just that he's just like, he wants Batman to break his code and the whole thing is just like, um, oh, you know, I, I want everyone to prove they're as chaotic as me. Like when he does the boat thing at the end. Yeah. It's like, and I want you to do it. So it's like, I want you to hit me. I want you, I want you to prove that you're just as horrible as me. And if I die in this moment, you're going to then, you know, become me or something like that. And he doesn't and he swerves and he avoids him. And he's like, oh, and he's almost disappointed in it. <laughs> and it's just, it's just great. And then you reveal that, that Commissioner Gordon, Gary Oldman was alive all along. And it's just got so many great moments. The action's phenomenal. The performances, even though there's, there's not that many lines, are great. And then you've got a reveal at the end. It's just got so many moments. And the whole film for me, I just love it. Obviously, Heath Ledger's performance is... Just so iconic, so, so captivating and, and brilliant. And the story itself is is great as well. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to go Dark Knight because that's one of the movies that I could just watch that over and over and over again and enjoy it. And obviously the kids aren't old enough to watch that yet. So but they by are this in this virtual world. They are in this virtual world. So I'm going to treat them to that.
And if they don't like it, I'll be furious. <laughs> that moment where he's sort of stumbling out of the crashed truck and Batman's oh. on the ground and the machine gun sort of goes off like yes. on its own and he sort of cackles to himself. Like, yeah. like you say, it's these minute moments that just make it mm, perfect. Yeah, it's so good. And the, 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 one of his uh, like henchmen tries to pull off Batman's mask and there's an electrical thing that shocks him. And then he's like, oh! And then he like, finds it funny. And then jumps over the top and, then, and he's like... Straddles and then him, he spits yeah. on him as well. It's like, has, that might have, it's, like, it's like the Joker. He's laughing. Thing. He's finding it funny. It's comical, but then he spits on him to show that it's this this gritty Nolan Joker. Like it just it's got everything. It's great. Oh, fantastic! Well, that's it, Blake. The curtains have closed. The guests are milling out, smiling, chatting, and thanking you for taking them on an incredible night at the movies. But before you go, it's time for this week's mystery question. As we ask, what's in the box? Uh, so. Uh, your question, oh, okay, uh, I, I, you've probably had it a million times, but it is our mystery question, so here we go. Uh, obviously, you had the In Between Us reunion show a couple of years ago, <laughs> which was incorrectly listed in some of the press as a new episode. Yeah. Any plans from creators Damon and Ian to ever bring it back in any form? No. Fine. Good. <laughs> That was, a, that was short and sweet. Yeah, I remember all that uh, that hoo-ha. It was just mad that basically everyone started calling that special like, it's a new episode. We, I was very clear with like, this is not a new episode. Yeah. This is like a, a, almost like a chat show reunion thing to talk about. I, I don't know whether people in certain marketing areas decided it will get more viewers if we pretend it's sort of like a new episode or something, mm. but it was never intended to be that. There was no chance of that happening. And yeah, and th then it just it was what it was. But I think a lot of people were disappointed because they tuned in for a new episode. Mm. And obviously that's not what they got. No, no. Uh, good. Well, that was it. That was short and sweet. Uh, but I appreciate your candor on our mystery question, your taxi has arrived to ferry you back to reality. But before you go, let's recap your perfect night out at the cinema. You are going with your children, but you are going with your children 10 to 15 years in the future. <laughs> yes. Specifically, I found a way to say it. You are going at 11.50 in the morning when it's quiet but not empty. You're sitting three quarters of the way back on an aisle because, like me, we have bladder issues let's call them <laughs> uh you are ordering a trough of sweet popcorn let's go for that about a tiny a tiny bottle of water the yeah. smallest <laughs> really bottle, tiny bottle of water. of water known to man we're putting up some posters as we walk to the auditorium your fondest movie memory is watching no country for old men without knowing anything about it your worst movie memory it was either fast zombies or sharks we've gone for jaws the last performance that brought you to tears. Frodo, Frodo. <laughs> Boromir's death in The Fellowship of the Ring. Your unpopular movie opinion is do not screen adverts for horror movies outside of a horror movie. Yes. Great. Uh, the movie that you're most looking forward to seeing at the cinema is uh, uh, The Old Republic, but probably won't be called The Old Republic. <laughs> <laughs> the moment that makes you pump your fist in the air is... The Legolas, Legolas, on the Legolas horse. getting on the horse. Thank you. Thank you for helping me out. Uh, cinema's most shocking. Much, I love this. Cinema's most shocking moment. Hans is the bad guy. Hans is the bad guy in Frozen. <laughs> Who saw that coming? <laughs> Your favourite piece of dialogue or line from a movie is the gas station scene, but also uh, in No Country for All Men, but also I'm in a glass case of emotion. Uh, the best use of music in a movie is Jewel of the Fates. And finally, you were screening for us The Dark Knight, Blake. Thank you for taking us on a trip to the movies. Have you had a good time? I've had a lovely time. Thank you for having me. Brilliant.